Hello, and welcome to the Remind Podcast, the podcast where we get inside the real estate entrepreneur's mind. My name is Harrison Smith. I'm the Director of Growth with the Matea Group of Kelly Williams Realty here in Maine and expanding throughout New England. And I'm joined today by David Lichten. How are you, David? Doing well, Harrison. Thanks for having me. I'm so glad to have you on here. Looking forward to talking about you and hearing about your story. So with that, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, what you're currently doing in the real estate space? Yeah, so um, I am the vice president at Select Realty Capital Group. We're a private mortgage brokerage out of Portland, Maine. Um, we are a kind of mom and pop shop on the private lending side. It's uh, me and my partner, Todd Settle. We have one other guy working with us, Mike Susi, who has been on the show before. He's with we White Point as well. Yeah, and uh, we do private lending, help place financing for opportunistic real estate investors, primarily in Maine. We do some stuff in New Hampshire and Massachusetts as well. And uh, a little bit less frequently, we'll go outside of the Northeast. Awesome. So as we generally find with folks that we've talked with, most people don't start in the real estate space. They eventually end up here, whether they intended to or not. So what can you tell us about where you started and how you ended up in this business? Yeah. So I'm not originally from Maine. I, I, I went to college up here and, and drank the Kool-Aid and stuck around, but I grew up in New York City. Um, and my dad is an architect and I pretty much spent my whole childhood on job sites, whether they were, uh, renovation projects in the city or, uh, new construction projects outside of the city and uh, a lot of time in new England as well. And that, that's kind of just the environment that I grew up in where we were always involved in some way, our own home apartment renovations as well, but, uh, doing not necessarily on the finance side focus, but uh, just sort of repurposing of, of spaces, whether they were already residential use or maybe a converted use, but doing something where there was a uh, breathing life into these sort of older un underutilized spaces. And when I graduated college, I, I kind of knew that I wanted to do something in real estate, not necessarily on the design side. Um, and I, I did meet with some realtors in, in the Portland area and, and kind of felt it out and it didn't necessarily feel like the right fit for me. There are aspects of both of those worlds that, that drew me. Um, and in my, uh, exploring what can a career in real estate look like, I did come across private lending and there are a couple of private lending companies in the Portland area. And, um, in, in doing sort of my own research, it, it kind of opened my eyes to, to this world where this career where. I get to be involved in redevelopment projects. I get to be involved in sort of the creative resolution side of how can you, how can you finance an otherwise complicated situation, things that banks might not necessarily be excited to do, things that might uh, involve a borrower who doesn't have all of the cash to do it themselves. Um, how can we make all these things happen? Um, and then it takes me to all these communities throughout Maine where there are these spaces that, um, you know, are not necessarily being used to their highest and best use. And we have an opportunity to both provide for those communities, provide housing, but also uh, tackle it from the investment standpoint. And I have a little bit of a competitive entrepreneurial side to me. So this is a, this is a sphere that kind of brings all those things together. Um, so that's sort of how I got into it. I did some consulting work at one of those private lending firms in the area for a few years, uh, met my current business partner, Todd Settle, uh, through that position and we opened up shop here about three years ago and, and we get to kind of have our hand in sort of all different kinds of projects uh, across all different asset classes all over the state. Right now I'm involved in projects anywhere from Bar Harbor down in New Hampshire as well. So we really cover the whole area and, and all different kinds of building types, commercial, industrial, retail, residential, all of it. Um, and, and people with different plans, people that are targeting different, you know, tiers of buyers, whatever it might be. And so we get to see just this really diverse array of, of different opportunities. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's been a, just a really interesting path and I've gotten to kind of, you know, dip my toes in a lot of different kinds of, uh, scenarios as a result. Yeah, that's awesome. So your background is you've seen kind of all the facets of real estate growing up and coming through the ranks. And then really this one speaks to you because it lets you really see again, all facets of real estate and, and be a problem solver. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and it's funny cause I, I was telling uh, my partner earlier today, I was just sharing a story from when I worked uh, for a GC, one of the GCs that I worked with, uh, did a lot of stuff with my dad. And that's how I, it was a summer job when I was like 16. And I was telling about how we were doing this uh, rehab on a, a remodel, not a rehab so much, but a, a remodel for a, a famous person in New York. And I was the sort of the grunt labor. I was hauling <laughs> all of the the trash out and the the service elevator that day in the building wasn't working. And I, I wind up having to take this the, the resident, you know, the residence use 
<laughs> elevator and one of the developers who had was a part owner of the building, you know, he's a billionaire or something, gets in the elevator and he tears his pants on one of the pieces of like, uh, uh, <laughs> metal that, that we were taking out. And, um, you know, the, his, his pair of pants were probably, you know, larger than some of the budgets that we work with <laughs> right, <laughs> right, yeah. of here. So yeah, it's, I've seen, I've seen all of it. Um, and it's just, I, you know, it's, it's a really cool way to kind of experience, um, you know, what does it mean to, to, you know, live in a home? A lot of people, you know, they don't necessarily get a chance to see all the different kinds of places, both, you know, size, levels of finishing, you know, locations, all of it, but it, yeah, we really get to see a lot. Yeah, that's fun. It's, it's just always nice to see how many different pieces there are, how many different workflows, how many different items, you know, go into those budgets and those plans. And it's always nice to see what that entire project looks like. Cause HGTV makes it look so easy, but in reality, it's a lot more complicated than TV makes it look. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's a, a scenario that I kind of try and, you know, warn, we, we work with people that are new to this, people that have been doing a lot of projects their whole lives, all different levels of experience. And I always try and kind of warn folks when, you know, when we're talking to a new potential borrower and, and if they're new to, to borrowing as well as new to investing, giving them that kind of that warning that, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of sort of, uh, fluff out there and what's on TV and, and, um, you know, thankfully there are things like bigger pockets and other forums that you can go to and actually hear kind of more horror stories type of stuff. But yeah, the, the TV shows that people watch where they're thinking, you know, I'm going to flip a house and I'm going to become a millionaire. Yeah. Uh, we try and warn them and say, you know, it, it doesn't always go that way. That's not a good representation of what, what all this can be. And, and it can be some really hard work. I mean, there are definitely real estate's a funny world to be in. You know, there's, there's folks that, you know, kind of wind up in deals where they make a, a huge return without very much work or, or, you know, without working very hard. And, um, and there are ones where people completely, you know, grind and, um, pour their soul and, and their bank accounts into mm -hmm. projects that will make a lot. Um, so it, it really, and I've had experiences like that, you know, in, in our lending work, we, we, there are deals where we really, uh, have to, uh, you know, put in the hours way more than, than other ones where, you know, we might be making a significantly larger fee from it. And it's just, you know, it, it, you see the whole run of it. Yeah, for sure. So let's, uh, let's dive into a little bit around what private lending is. So lots of people talk about, you know, sourcing private money and talking to private lenders, but what. In, in your mind, how do you define what private lending is? That's a great question. So it, it is really easy to kind of look at it and say, you know, it's, it's this product that is really just there for people that are flipping houses, people that are, um, you know, looking for, uh, financing to do new construction, but, uh, it, it's really any, it's, it's non-traditional lending. So what, what is the, the need for capital and you know, where is that capital coming from? For my firm, and there's lots of different private lenders throughout the country, throughout the area, within the state, my firm primarily works with high net worth individuals who are looking for opportunities to invest in real estate, but not necessarily take on the project themselves. Okay. And there are other lenders out there that might be sourcing their capital from a hedge fund, uh, a line of credit with a bank, um, or maybe they are uh, sitting there and looking for people to make individual contributions to a fund and then filling, filling up the, the financing need through that means. So there's a lot of different ways you can like, really, it's just any kind of non-traditional source of capital and, and traditional being banks, mortgage companies, folks that are operating from, you know, large sums of, of capital that generally speaking, have a level of like federal insurance behind them. You know, there's, there's different layers to all of that, but for us, it's, uh, we broker the financing, so we're never actually um, handling capital ourselves. It always passes through an attorney, uh, title company, and um, we're providing uh, really a, a means to connect people that are sitting on capital that they want to invest and, and diversify how they invest, and this is one means to that end, and people that are in need of money to do a project. And for us, uh, the reason why I kind of say, you know, it's, it's sort of private lending is really kind of any scenario. Uh, my firm doesn't lend to individuals or, or deal with owner occupied scenarios. We're strictly in the commercial lending space and I'm not going to dive into kind of all the nuances mm -hmm. of, of yeah. that, of that distinction, but we are really able to be involved in any kind of scenario where there's a need for, uh, an agile lender 
the big reason why people use our financing is the timing component, because we can move mm -hmm. much faster than a bank. Um, and maybe it's a risk tolerance perspective. We're willing to look at what is a, a project uh, going to be worth after you improve it, after you make physical improvements to it, after you improve the cash flow of it, whatever the sort of way to add value to it is. We'll look at that as sort of the end picture, as well as providing the funds to make those improvements versus a bank which is going to look at present value. Maybe they would look at after the after improved value, the ARV, if there's, you know, repairs involved. Um, but they'll have a little bit more restriction to it. They'll be a little bit more conservative in their approach to it. But, but for us, it's, can we be in a first position on some real estate? Mm -hmm. And does the borrower have a level of personal risk, skin in the game? Is it capital of their own? Are they pledging additional pieces of collateral? Or are they offering equity in another property they own? If they have, you know, a, a fair amount of equity in another asset, how can we balance those things out so that there's a level of personal risk involved on the borrower standpoint? And then the last bit just being, how are they going to exit the deal? Is it something where they're going to sell the property in the event that somebody say does a fix and flip um, or a new build? Are they going to go to their bank having made all these improvements to it so that it would then qualify for financing um, and then refinance and, and keep it long-term as a, a long-term hold investment. Um, but those aren't the only scenarios. You know, I talk to people all the time who, you know, they, they have some cash, maybe they have a credit issue. Um, maybe they inherited a family investment property that, that they don't have the capital now to make improvements to it. And they want to either sell it or keep it. You know, there's all different sorts of scenarios where really it's, it's, can we be in a first down something? I need to get from point A to point B. How do I get there? And and we're that vessel. You know, we're the we're the people that are able to provide that um, bridge to get from point A to point B. And and in most frequently, it's getting somebody from I want to acquire a property that I'm going to improve, and then I want to sell it. But we do stuff as well where you could buy a building where it's perfectly ready to go. Maybe it's a commercial property, and there's no tenants, there's no occupancy to it, and it's, it's ready to go. It just needs, um, income on it. And so we're providing the financing for a borrower, a borrower who would be able to get bank financing normally. Um, they go ahead and lease out the building and then they turn around to their bank and refinance it. And we'll craft our financing to fit whatever their specific scenario needs. So there's all sorts of scenarios that come up. It's, it's again, it's really not just those sort of immediate value add stuff. It's really, I mean, I'm here in this position and my present position doesn't allow me on my own to get to the future scenario. Mm -hmm. How can I get there? And we're here to help. Yeah. And I love the, the way you explain that. Cause really, you know, you're a capital matchmaker. You've got people that have said, Hey, over here, I've got money. I want to invest. Um, but I don't want to be hands-on. I don't want to be in there flipping properties or, or doing the work, but I've got money. I'd like to invest somewhere. And then you've got borrowers saying, geez, I've got a deal and I know what I'm doing, but I don't have the capital. And then right. you're kind of marrying that all up in a way that makes sense for both parties. And really you're enabling projects that, you know, as you said, traditional banks and conventional lending just wouldn't be able to do. They don't have the appetite for it. They don't have the ability to be agile or flexible like you do. So really you're able to operate in this different space where as long as you can put together a deal that makes sense, you can bring parties together and make things happen. Absolutely. And, and as part of that, you know, while I'm not necessarily a real estate broker, um, we do our homework and monitor the markets to the nth degree so that you know, we're not ever, um, approaching scenario because what we're doing, you know, on paper is high risk, mm -hmm. um, given that there's, you know, levels of construction needed, generally speaking, the properties are risky on paper, the borrower might be risky on paper, but what we're trying to do is constantly be keeping the pulse of the market in all these areas that we led so that we can turn around to our investors and be able to provide them with a very quick analysis, very accurate analysis that says. This is why the situation works. And this is why we see this going in a path where not only will, you know, the borrower succeed. And if that means that the borrower succeeds, then the investor succeeds, they are getting a certain level of return and their money is coming back to them and recycling to go into another deal. So for the investor side, if we're underwriting good deals, um, their money is recycling and growing and generating more opportunities. Um, to, to maybe, you know, maybe, maybe they're an investor who doesn't want to necessarily grow their portfolio with us, but the income generated by their lending practice with us goes into safer things, you know, getting into stocks, getting into, you know, what other, maybe sure. they're taking the capital and, and buying 
investment properties of their own, you know, whatever it might be. So, you know, we're, we're, uh, a, a, a practice that, you know, again, we recognize sort of that we're often dabbling in these areas that can be high risk in the eyes of a bank, but we're not ever trying to push that limit too far. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to set again, our borrowers up to succeed. And as far as the way that my company functions sort of philosophically, if our borrowers are winning and our investors are winning, that means that people are succeeding in their projects. Our investors are succeeding in their investments. And that is leading to additional deals through the borrowers that we're working with, because most frequently we're working with repeat customers. So a lot of people that we do work with are again, falling into those sort of three primary spaces of flippers, builders, and folks that are investing in long-term holds. And those are growth-minded people. So if you're somebody sure. flipping, you're not just doing one project a year, no. you're doing a few. Um, and, and to what scale, you know, depends on the borrower. But if you're somebody who's investing in multifamily property and that's what you want to do, you want to build up this portfolio of passive income, especially if you're young, where you're willing to kind of like pay the upfront hit uh, to get into those long-term performing assets, you're not doing, it's not a great investment if you're sitting on one duplex. Right. You know, there is a level of, I need to get to scale so that I can then go hire uh, Harrison's property management company right. <laughs> to, to well, manage it for me. Um, versus me trying to self-manage where I'm working my W-2 and I got a heating system kick out and I can't go leave my job to go deal with that or, you know, I can't get somebody on board to go over there today, whatever it might be, you're thinking about how does this fit into the greater picture of my investment perspective? And to go back to kind of earlier in our conversation, how do we navigate those conversations when we're first working with a borrower? We're, we're asking them, you know, what are your expectations of investing in real estate? Do you want to do flips all the time? Do you want to get short-term rentals in vacation areas? Do you want to only focus on, you know, industrial properties? Whatever that path is, we're always going to approach the opportunity to lend, taking that borrower's wants and needs into account. If I see something like, you know, if you came to me and said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm only trying to, you know, grab buy and holds. I want to do value add stuff so that I have a good amount of equity. When I go to my bank and refinance, I can get some cash back and I've still got some equity. Or maybe you only want to do flips, whatever it might be. But then you come to me and say, hey, I want to do this ground up self-storage yeah. development. I would say, you know, that could be a really great investment opportunity for some people. But, but let me, let's look at this plan for you. Do you have, you know, the right kind of crews lined up? Because you're not going to have a guy who does, you know, interior remodels do your you know, right. or your, or your acre slab and put up, you know, uh, aluminum framed building, you know, that you yep. want to see the borrower succeed. So we're, you know, if, if we're almost serving in a consultant capacity as well, uh, then we don't get paid for it, but we're doing that, you know, regularly, I would much rather say no to a deal, um, that I see problems for the borrower on and not get a fee for my company versus, you know pushing them into a deal where they're going to, you know, lose all their hair trying to pursue it. You know, it's somebody gets into one deal and, and they barely get their, come out with their shirt. You know, they're not necessarily inclined to go do many more. Right. Right. That's what I love about what you guys do is it, it's not like, how do I get you into this loan today? It's, is this even the right loan for you? Is this the right project for you? Let's work together on that because you know, continuing down this path, let's go ahead and kind of debunk the myth that lit, lays around this product, which is what you're describing, you know, private lending definitely has long-term components, but what you're describing really is hard money. Yeah. And yeah. people hear the word hard money, the phrase hard money and think, oh goodness, you know, these are loan sharks and I'm going to lose my shirt and I'm, it, it, you know, it's a bad thing. And really what you just described is hard money in a way that describes it as such a great tool to enable activity, but it scares a lot of people. So when you talk about hard money with people and they get kind of clammed up, what is the explanation you give them as to why this is a product that although it has a negative connotation is something they should absolutely want. Yeah. And, and so I think the, the, you know, kind of just going back to sort of when we approach them and can we be in a first position on something is always like the, you know, let, is this viable? Can we be in a first is more some skin in the game? How are they going to pass off? So we can really land in any scenario when you think about that, like if the, as long as it's not owner occupied, as long as they're taking title under a legal entity, we can land in any scenario, not necessarily going to be a good fit. No, you know, there's going to be a lot of instances where going to the bank is the best way to go. Um, I just in general have a mindset of, well, a couple things. So Maine's a big, small town. 
<laughs> sure is. There are a million and a half people in the whole state. Um, that's changing, sure. And there are a lot of people moving into Southern Maine. You know, we can, that's a whole several hour long conversation. Absolutely. But Maine's a big, small town. And, and then when you think about, you know, what does the real estate community look like? Um, you know, it's really easy to, to develop a bad reputation. And mm -hmm. to me, um, being the sort of loan sharky kind of perspective on this, um, that's not growth minded. You know, that's, that's, I can get one loan with somebody, um, you know, we're going to be really inflexible. We're going to give them a hard time. We're going to, um, just, you know, not set them up for success. Um, that leads to me only doing one deal with them and then me going back to the hunt. Um, yep. A lot of sort of things that we think about in, in being an entrepreneur, and you guys feel this a lot the same way, mm -hmm. is I don't get paid by the hour. Correct. I don't, you know, my, my, my day is um, what, what number of minutes do I spend that directly leads to growing my business? And if I am thinking about things as a just doing stuff right now in the immediate, I could close some deals right away. I could look at, look at a lot of loans, a lot of opportunities to lend that wouldn't necessarily benefit my investors, wouldn't necessarily benefit the borrower, but I'd get a fee out of it. Right, exactly. That does nobody any good. I'm a young guy. That's the other thing. Like I think about this in a lot of the same ways that I think people who were young getting into investing in real estate should think about it as, you know, are, are you looking for something that's going to make you a ton of money right now? Or are you looking at something that's going to set you up for a good life? Yep. And for me in the lending space and for being in essentially a big small town where people talk and having a, a good reputation is important. If I am always being honest and always looking out for the people that I'm working with, um, then that will ultimately lead to more business for me. So it is selfish. You know, I'm not going to yeah. ever be out here trying to make money. That's what we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Right. You get into real estate to make money. Yeah. So if I'm out there, you know, being a shark, um, you know, Maine's a small pond. I'm going to eat everything, mm -hmm. you know? So if I can always be presenting myself as an asset, being a valuable tool in the toolbox. And that's one of the ways that I like to think about private lending We're that multifunctional tool, you know, you're not going to pull out your Leatherman to build a house, but mm -hmm. there are going to be some things here and there over the course of building the house where something in there is useful, mm -hmm. but I'm still going to want to have my hammer. You know, the bank can be your hammer. You know, nope. you're still going to want to have a, a circular saw that can be your credit union, whatever. We're going to be a tool that, can be really helpful in a lot of different instances and a lot of instances were not going to be the best tool to be used. And I'll tell you that. So as far as when people are thinking about working with a private lender, come talk to us, you know, I'll tell you if I think this is a good scenario and I'll tell you exactly what it's going to cost. I have never had a closing statement where from when I quoted the borrower to actually having a closing statement drafted, there's any difference. You know, we don't hide our fees. If anything, I try to talk through what does the loan look like in several projects with a prospective borrower before they actually ultimately pull the trigger on something so that they have a really firm understanding of what they're getting into. And they have a really firm understanding that when that deal finally does come up, I can go back and look at all the 10 different email chains that we have where I'm quoting them what the loan looks like and it's consistent. So. I can't go out there and, and, you know, go into all these forums on Facebook and bigger pockets and, and be able to respond to every person that says, oh, this is a scam. Right. Right, there's a lot of hard money lenders out there that are, you know, having you pay an application fee and you never hear from them. Yep. Right. You know, I'm, I'm not just some website with a 1-800 number. My office is in the old port. I want people to come in and, and chat with us and I'll go meet you on site and walk a project with you. So uh, we have a philosophy within our firm that we meet every bar we're on site and we shake every hand of anybody that we do a deal with. Um, so, uh, I can't go out there and, and, you know, dispel every feeling of, of slidiness that comes with working with a hard money lender. Um, but I find that when, when people, you know, actually work with me, you know, they're getting an honest shape. You know, I'm, I'm in the community. I live in Gardner. 
I work here in Portland. I'm on the road every day. I'm up in Oxford County later this afternoon. Um, we get out, you know, we're there, we'll meet you. We'll, we'll walk through with you. Um, if there's a need for a sub, if there's a need for a bank lender, we connect the dots, you know, we're not just connecting the borrower with the capital. We do everything that we can to make sure the project moves quickly. I mean, I've had borrowers who are investing from out of state and I've had to call them up and just say, I think, you know, I'm suspicious of so-and-so. It doesn't seem like the work is being done quickly. I am concerned for you. Um, you know, they're not even scenarios necessarily where a borrower might be slow in their interest payments or whatever it might be. But I'm going to let them know if I have concerns. Do you want me to contact contractors? I know. Do you want me to contact potential takeout lenders? How can we help? Um, and you know, if, if somebody feels like we're not trying to help and they're having a rough time, um, then, you know, I guess we screwed up or mm -hmm. maybe, you know, the borrower, you know, is blinded by their own rage. I don't know, but we are always looking for wins. And if the borrower wins, you know, we win the investor wins. So that's what we're looking for. Yeah, I love that explanation because a lot of people have that thought of you're going to be getting your interest payments with a lead pipe or something like that, knocking on their door to break their yeah, kneecaps. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a lot of the connotation of hard money. And really what you guys do is you are, you are partners, you are consultants, you are making sure that the borrowers are in a good position, making sure that the capital is in a good position, making sure it all makes sense, you know, on site, hand in hand. You're not just trying to give them the hard sell, used car salesman sell to put them into bad loans because what people forget in all this is that, yes, we've got a history of people that have written bad loans that's out there. Yeah. But what they don't realize is that the worst case scenario for you guys is to have a loan go bad because really you don't want to foreclose. You don't want to take the asset back. You don't want to have to do that with the borrower. And also you continue to maintain the capital you have because you're a good steward of it. So if you're out there just shoving people into bad loans and they're going bad all over the place, you know, David Lichten won't be in business very long. How do I, how do I entice other people to come invest with me? And how do I have that money go back out to do more loans? If we tapped out all of our capital right away in bad loans, I would have a really nice quarter and a really bad year. Right. Exactly. That short-term benefit, the one marshmallow versus two scenario of, right. I can just go slam a bunch of business in here, but I know it's not good. I'd rather invest the time, build the relationship and put them in the right deal than just any deal. Yeah. And I, you know, on that note, so I have a, I have a borrower right now that we're working on a loan with that we have never done any business with them before, but we have been talking every couple months for a year. And finally, you know, I've spent, I put in the hours again, not having no financial, uh, immediate benefit. The borrower has not paid anything, you know, to my firm by any means, but we're now at a point where they're ready to pull the trigger. You know, we're, we're patient and, and, and I, you know, we try and talk about, you know, when you're looking at what is your investment strategy and how can we help you in that across any part of investing, whether it's real estate, any other financial, you know, whatever it is, whatever you're doing, discipline is one of the most important things. Mm -hmm. And people that, you know, again, if we see them kind of straying out, you know, stepping out of their lane, I'm not going to chastise them, but I'm going to just say, you know, like, Hey, this is different. How does this fit? You know, have you thought about X, Y, and Z? And I'm not going to stand up here and say that I'm an expert in every single method of investing in real estate. I've sure. not learned. Um, but I think I know what I know and I know what I don't know. And mm -hmm. I know when I don't know something, I know who to go and ask. And that's, that's, ha that's half the battle, knowing when you don't know. Exactly. And that is that again, in investing in real estate, having that discipline and knowing when something is, is something that you really know and knowing when something you don't know, um, and sticking to what you do know, um, that's. That's a huge part of it. So, um, when I talk with new borrowers and they get caught up in the shiny object because they really want to do a deal, you know, having them just be able to, you know, have the guardrails up a little bit, you know, I, again, I, I, I don't want to ever position somebody where they're not going to succeed or it's going to be a really, really tough path. And we have people who dive into projects that, you know, are willing to move forward. And we tell them, you know, we can fund this for you. We can do this, but here are our concerns. And some of them get through it and they really feel the heat and they get out alive and they're, and they're good. And, and they're ready, you know, they learn a lot of lessons. Maybe they don't make as much as they thought they were, but they learn the lessons and they take the lessons and grow from that. That's, you know, we don't just want to think about growing financially, growing, you know, intelligently, you know, growing intellectually, learn, taking lessons, you know, what's take the data and make, you know, make analyses from it. Um, 
And those people, you know, don't necessarily repeat those mistakes. We also have a lot of borrowers that, you know, despite our, you know, saying like, I don't, you know, we can do this, but I don't think this is, these are my concerns. Um, and they feel the heat and those things play out kind of how we warn them. Um, and they, you know, people are stubborn. Um, mm. that's, you know, just being stubborn can be a really good thing in some instances, but in, especially in investing in value add real estate scenarios, it can be really tough. And ego is part of that as well. Oh, you know, e ego think, will kill you in this business. Yes. Just be humble, be honest, be humble. Um, you know, that's, and, and communicate, pick up the phone. You know, there's a lot of things in this business, um, where, you know, you, you miss out on opportunities because you don't call somebody back and, and, um, you know, some of the things again, philosophically that we think about are every person is a lead. Treat everybody like they're elite. Treat everybody who comes in the door, um, you know, like they're going to make you a thousand million dollars, you know, whatever the number is, whatever your expectation is, and not just in real estate, but in any kind of sales position. Treat every single person the same, you know, that's, even if they don't necessarily treat you back that way, treat everybody right. the same. Um, Maine is a really funny state where it's really easy to judge a book by, by its cover generally, but, you know, you could go, I went to a bunch of real estate auctions last week and you could be standing in there and there's a lot of folks who look really gruff. And, you know, they could have seven digits in the bank account and you would, you know, you would not think that. So, yeah. you know, shake everybody's hand, look them in the eye, treat them with respect. Um, I, I <laughs> am always just on that note, like really paying a lot of attention to sort of micro, uh, interactions that people have, you know, who holds the door for somebody, um, you know, who says please and thank you. Those are when I meet people for coffee or go out to lunch with them, how do they interact with wait staff? Mm. how does everybody treat, you know, other folks? And, you know, those, those little interactions can tell you a lot as far as how somebody operates and how they run their business. Um, how do they treat the workers that are, that are working for them? You know, a lot of that goes a long way in just seeing, you know, who's going to be able to hold together a team where everybody hangs in it and sticks together and who's going to have a hard time keeping people working, you know, getting good labor, you know? I, I talk to a lot of people who have been doing this for a long time where they have subs that continue to work for them, even though they could go off and make more money taking on some big, you know, commercial price, you know, whatever it might be. Yep. But, you know, respect goes a long way. Yeah, for sure. And I, th I feel like everybody that we've had on this so far has mentioned relationships and the importance of those, but it's relationships in the sense of who do you know, how do you treat them? Um, you know, but also how well do you interact with people? How much do people want to be around you? Are you surrounded by the right people? There's so many aspects to the relationship side of it, but at the end of the day, it's all about who do we know, how do we know them, how do we treat them, and would they do business with us, you know, now or again? And it's so important that we take those relationships, not for granted, like you're saying, treat everybody like they could be a high value relationship because you never know who might turn out to be. Yeah. But if you always come from contribution and curiosity and, and trying to add value and be helpful, the right people will emerge. You're not just going to keep wasting your time because you're the nice guy. You know, nice guys in this business don't finish last. Nice guys win. Nice guys yeah. win this game because you tend to attract more people into your world that want to stay, that are loyal to you, that will work with you, that will do things with you. And quite honestly, there are situations where we've won deals because we just weren't jerks. Like we were nice people to deal with right. and that goes a long way. Yeah, yeah, it absolutely does. Um, I had a client who did a flip down and you had actually, you had looked at it too, down yep. in North Berwick. And, uh, this is in the last, you know, year and a half with the current real estate craziness mm -hmm. that we've had. And they had a buyer emerge for this house. It was not the highest offer that they received, but the guy was a VA guy. They were, they were like a friend of a friend and it was a coincidence that they got connected and he sold the guy the house, even though he probably could have made 20, 30 grand more selling it to somebody else. And, you know, I didn't really bat an eye at that. Uh, th mm. that bar, I hadn't necessarily worked together before that project, but, um, it told me a lot about them for sure. And, um, you know, I, I, whenever I see that guy call, I, I get excited, you know, yeah. like that's a good person. I want to work with that guy. Absolutely. We, we want to work with good people and that's true in all aspects of this business. We want to be, we want to be working with and surrounded by good people. So one of the perspective I want to add on this before we move on is the whole hard money thing. I actually look at hard money 
and especially working with you guys as a huge value add to myself. And I look at that in the sense of, I'm not just getting a lender who's going to take an application and then go to a closing. I'm working with a lender who's going to get to know me, ask me questions, understand who I am, understand what I'm looking for, look at my deal, give me an opinion. So it's almost like a, it's like having a, a free second look at every deal that I do. Yeah. But also I look at hard money too, as a risk mitigation strategy. I could go buy the deal and put all my money in the pot. And if something goes bad, the only guy holding the bag is me, or I can look at using hard money and yeah, I'm going to pay for the hard money. I get that. And it's only fair to compensate somebody for the risk they're taking, but now my capital can go further. I can do more deals. I'm not the one with all the skin in the game. I can move faster and, and I'm not all in on a single project. So for me, you know, as whatever connotation or whatever feelings hard money bring out of people, I look at it as a huge value add to me in so many ways that I've done a deal all cash. I will never do it again. Uh, <laughs> yeah. it, because honestly I sleep better at night knowing I'm not the only guy on it. Yeah. And, and that's, I mean, you, you touch on a really good point, Harrison, and, and, that, and that's, you know, we think about leverage, you know, again, how does this all fit into mm -hmm. what you want to do from an investment perspective? And we do work with a lot of people that could be doing one or two deals, a couple deals, sure. all cash. And, you know, again, how does all that fit into your perspective of investing? Are you really targeting growth? Is that something where if you have all your cash tied up in one deal and you as somebody who, you know, has their eye on a bunch of different avenues for mm -hmm. investing, it's not always going to be a flip. It's not always going to be buy and hold. There's, you know, other things even outside of that, but is it going to be something where, you know, if I have all my cash shut up in this one project, all of a sudden now I have closed doors for myself on other things that could come up. Totally. Or I maybe not necessarily have closed that door, but I have made it harder to swing that door wide open mm. because all of a sudden now, all right, am I going to the bank and getting a home equity line on this project I'm halfway through? Or am I having to go then tie up a first on both properties? Like how, how do I? How do I balance all of this? Mm -hmm. Those are things that we can do. We will balance things out if, if that's the path that needs to happen. But if you're somebody who comes in and says, say, hey, I've got 100K and I want to build out an apartment portfolio. Well, you could be buying, you know, maybe not with 100K, depending on what you want to do. Yeah, but depending on the market. You've got, you've got a sum of money and that allows you to buy one building at a time. Mm -hmm. You can have a bank involved. You're probably going to wind up overpaying on it in this market because you're going with a bank financed offer and then you're making up the difference from the appraised value to what, you know, mm -hmm. you had offered. So you're tapping into more of your cash reserves and then you got to go in and do all the renovations out of pocket or you're getting a, a HELOC on your home, whatever right. it might be free of cash, you're making things more complicated for yourself. And people look at our financing and sort of the initial first bet is, okay, these interest rates are higher than what I would get with a bank. It's a little scary. Yeah, that's not wrong. It is more expensive than going to a bank for a 30-year mortgage. Sure. But you're only paying these rates, interest only, for what, three to 12 months, depending on how big your project is. So if you're somebody who is thinking, okay, I can leverage this option into doing four flips at a time instead of doing one all by my own, my own capital, well, all of a sudden now, instead of making, say, more on my one deal, but I'm only doing one deal every six months, I can have four projects going at a time where I make 70% of what would be my return on one investment, but I'm doing 70% times four. Right. And then I can do that again that year. Well, what, what's really the better option? If you're looking at it truly in a vacuum where what does this one thing perform at? Well, yeah, you're not going to make as much money in that vacuum. Right. But when you look at it as far as what does this look like on my whole year? What does this look like as far as my year to year growth and building up my portfolio? Well, if I've got some cash and I have to go to the bank and I have to self fund my renovations and I have to right. wait for that bucket to fill back up from the cash flow from that property, you're not doing a couple a year. You're no. buying one every couple of years and, and you're, you know, that's not growth. It is, but it's. Yeah. It's just, it's really, no, it's slow and it, it just takes away your flexibility. So you've got access to this tool to your point that enables a lot of things. The whole concept of OPM, everybody wants to talk about OPM, but then. When you get to it, some people are afraid to use OPM being other people's money. So this is really the ultimate enabler to growth, faster growth opportunity. Yeah. And, and you know, that said, like, I've looked at doing this for my own stuff as well, but like, you know, if, if, if you're looking at something like that and you truly want to use other people's money, well, if you see a deal where you can come in and buy it using hard money, but also have a limited partnership involved where you could have defer, you know, preferred payments out from whatever that asset does, you could have a, a person behind you member of your LLC 
who's not necessarily an ownership stake where they have to come on as an additional guarantor of the deal. Sure. Yep. That's a larger conversation that we can have about structuring ownership and everything. But there are ways that you can do it where you have hard money, do the acquisition and renovation, if that's the deal, if that's what that scenario involves, and then go ahead and have a limited partner involved in that where you know, they're all revenue go, you know, all the profit goes to them until they make their money back with a certain level of return, whatever your structure is. And then their shares either revert to you or they, you have an option at that point to trigger a buyout, whatever, however you want to do it. But you could truly do this using other people's money where at the end of the day, your investors made a good return. You've refinanced out into long-term debt with a bank or whatever it is. And this is specifically in the sense of doing it as a long-term hold. But as a Burr strategy, which I can use on this podcast, knowing people understand it, right? Yep. Like, yep. Um, that if you're doing it that route, then you really are using truly other people's money. You have somebody come in with X amount of capital contribution to the LLC. They come in as a limited partner. And then you make that acquisition, do whatever improvements, get tenants, refinance it. And maybe you're not making anything back on it in the first couple of years. But when your investor has been paid out, you have an asset that is cash flowing and from when you refinanced it to when you've paid out your limited partner, you've also paid down your debt with your bank. So all of a sudden you have greater equity. Maybe then you're rolling into a refinance, pulling cash out of it, which you won't pay taxes on. And then all of a sudden you've got a performing asset, which you put none of your own money into a chunk of cash to then roll into the next deal. <clears throat> Yeah, it's infinite cash on cash return, little to yeah. no risk to you. And you come out of this thing with an asset that you own that's cash flowing with equity that really, other than some blood, sweat, and tears, didn't actually cost you anything. Absolutely. Hard money is a thing where it can be really beneficial. Um, it, can, it can be taxing in mm -hmm. a really narrow focus. But when you understand how it fits into the larger puzzle, it can just really allow for that exponential leverage, just really, I mean, and that's a crazy, a, a really weird way to phrase it, exponential leverage, right. but that's what it is. You're leveraging your leverage. Yeah. And we should probably do a whole separate show getting into deal structures and things like that. Cause we could keep going on this. Cause there's so many avenues here where you can utilize, whether it's this or some, something similar to it to create these amazing outcomes. If you're just willing to be creative. And if you're also willing to delay some gratification, if you're willing to give yeah. somebody a first position in priority, you can treat them really well, exit them from a deal and then control the whole deal and all the upside of it. If you just do it right. Yeah. And a lot of people who are getting into investing in real estate, they're generally, they're young and they're thinking about it as I don't want to work my W2 by the time I'm 50. Right. I want to have this performing portfolio that, you know, I can kick back and go live in Aruba or whatever, whatever, you know, yep. for me, it's, I want to be up near Sunday river. <laughs> there you go. That's what I want. But yeah, it's something where if you're thinking about it as I'm, I'm young, I'm going to bust my ass right now. But if I am able to add these cash flowing opportunities and build out my portfolio, I don't need it right now. But what it is doing for me is I am paying down, I'm taking a little bit of money. You know, cash flow doesn't necessarily mean that you're making, you know, a whole nother salary. Right. But even if, if you're in the black, you're paying down the debt, you're writing off your interest as well, mm -hmm. and you are adding value to something that even, you know, if we're not going to always have years where the property values grow, you know, 25% or whatever, no. it's, just not, it's nonsensical to think that this two-year gap is going to be forever. But if you are continuously in the black and refinancing, you know, every five years or whatever, so that you're structuring that, that you're not necessarily, you're continuing to reap the benefits of paying interest, which how we want to interpret that as benefit is another debate. Right, right. But if you're continuing to do that and building equity in these properties, well, you know, are you then setting yourself up where, you know, you're 40, you've done this for five years, you have a ton of equity in a pretty decent sized portfolio. Well, now you're 1030 running that into a single asset, you know, right. larger commercial property, whether it's residential, retail, whatever. But it, it can be something that, again, is the big picture, you know, how do I perform in a year? How do I perform in five years? What is my 10 year system leading into then for that, you know, for me, I'm 31. When I'm 50, 
you know, what am I sitting on? Have I sold all my residential? Now I just own industrial that's close to 95. So then I have, you know, constant, you know, occupancy and, you know, what, how does that all fit in? And then if it, that's the stepping stone for when you're 50, okay, well then in the next 20 years, then by the time you're 70, do you then have that asset class free and clear? You know, what is the, how does it, right. you know, where do you want to go with it? Um, Absolutely. So yeah, so I, I easy ramble right there. <laughs> yeah. But it, I think for those of us that are in it and have seen it and know people that are doing this, it's really kind of an eye-opening moment. It's an eye-opening thing to actually witness the fact that this is an incredibly powerful asset and very powerful industry to people. And there's a reason that 90% of all millionaires are, are millionaires because of real estate. Yeah. yeah. Because these are the opportunities that it presents and it allows you to go a lot of different directions with a lot of different risk profiles. And in some cases, little to no risk profile if you do it right. So it is an incredible opportunity in front of people to be in real estate in some aspect. Yeah. And then, you know, even throwing on top of that, the concept of like syndications that are now like a huge thing, like right. that's just another added wrinkle on top of it, where you really can sit back depending on your level of involvement. Mm -hmm. You really can sit back and not necessarily need to be concerned that your property manager is going to call you and say, Hey man, like the boilers, you know, blew on the 30 unit that we have, like, right. you know, you got a $250,000 check ready to go. No headaches at all. So, <laughs> all right. So let's bring this back to David for a little bit. Yeah. What do you think has been most important to your success? Is there a particular habit, trait, mindset, mentor, you know, what do you point to? Uh, yeah, we kind of touched on this before, but, um, you know, just really be honest, pick up the phone, return calls, just, you know, be accessible and um, be a resource, you know, show that you are valuable. Um, and, and a lot of that is. Um, again, you know, treating people right, answering the phone, you know, if you miss a call, return a call, um, and being on it, you know, no. don't, don't lose focus in that sense. You know, um, there's a, a, a level of, you know, kind of relentless understanding of how does every action fit into the big picture. And for me, a lot of that is my brain. You know, I, mm -hmm. I have my own goals outside of my day-to-day -day job that overlap a lot with what I'm doing. But as far as growing myself as a professional, it's sticking to that discipline. You know, to me, it's, there are times where I get angry and it's, and it's hard to maintain that, you know, I want to scream at somebody and, and not, <laughs> you know, be the bigger person. Um, every day, every week, you know, where we deal in a stressful industry and there's stuff yep. that happens all the time. Um, but being disciplined, uh, discipline and treating people the right way. I guess, you know, from an investment perspective, discipline, how you carry yourself every day, um, you know, just understanding that, you know, and, and those two things, obviously there's so much overlap in that, um, how you interact with anybody at all, um, you know, makes, makes a big difference. And, um, for me, again, I'm young. There are people that I might not ever do anything with, uh, you know, in my thirties, they might have one interaction with me in passing at some event where we don't even know that we might have a prospective opportunity to do business together, but I might be a jerk to them. And then all of a sudden, you know, why would they, you know, I might be able to do all the right things for them from a business perspective, but they don't want to do anything with me because I was rude to them. Yep. Um, so in every action that you take, you want to incentivize people to work with you and you know, whether it's, uh, a shallow thing of, I'm just doing this to make more money or you genuinely, that's the person that you want to be. And for me, it's a combination of both. I want to make a lot of money. I don't want to work my whole life, you know? Um, but also just be kind. Right. Ultimately, we all realize that we make more money when we help other people make more money. It's the old quote of, of, you get what you want when you help others get what they want. You know, and really that's what this is. And it's use the word brand. Ultimately, when you're out interacting with people, you're at events, you're wherever you might be, you're taking coffee, those interactions, people remember that. And that becomes your brand. Yeah. People say, oh, do you know David? Oh yeah, he's a great guy. I love David. I'd refer anybody to him versus, you know, David, oh, that guy's a jerk. Like I wouldn't do anything with him. He's rude to me at some event or something like that. Really the more positive interactions you rack up. The more people that get to know you, they begin to like you, they begin to trust you. And that's ultimately what it takes for them to come back and do business with you. Yes. You know, and you're constantly planting those seeds, which is huge because ultimately if you add value, you come from contribution and you want to be helpful, the business will be there. It's going to come to you. Yeah. And that's, and you know, that's on that note, you know, 
the, the sort of the lessons that I've learned in a lot of this is that, you know, it, this is not an industry where, you know, you can just like really like hustle hard for a short period of time and mm -hmm. you know, you you've got the ball rolling and it, and it goes, there is a need to constantly be focused on the big picture and growth. Yep. It's not, you know, like it's really easy to get bogged down on the things that are closing this week, the things that you need to right. do this month. Um, it's any moment where there's breathing room is time where you're not growing. Sure. And it's not always going to be like that. Again, you know, like I have, you know, 30 more years of doing this in front of me and, you know, hopefully it's less than that, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's something where I try to think about. If I'm having a really good month and closing a lot of deals, we're doing a lot of business. Um, if I'm coming out of that and taking a, a, you know, a breath of fresh air, you know, sure. It's great to do that for, you know, an hour a day, whatever you need. Self care is important also, um, uh, being in a good mental health space is important. Absolutely. Um, but taking your foot off the gas. That is, you know, that that's when you feel it. And for the way that my business functions. If I take my foot off the gas, I might not necessarily feel it in that minute, in that month, whatever right. it is, but three months from then, six months from then, I might be looking at my pipeline and thinking it's a little empty, or maybe my phone's not ringing as much as, as much as it should be. So always thinking about who are the people that I need to be talking to when talking to those people, asking them, who do I need to be talking to and following up on that stuff. Um, you know, really what we're doing is growing roots and trying to make our root system as dense as possible. You know, we want to, we want to make this really, really, um, crazy web of nodes of, you know, communication, who are our reference points. And yep. if I have more people that have positive experiences with me. If I have more people that know what my product is and understand what private lending is. When they're at the barbecue next weekend and they're talking with their brother-in-law, their aunt, whatever it might be, and they mention something, you know, there's going to be moments where it clicks and that's what we're looking for. You know, we're planting a lot of seeds and not everybody that we talk to, not every instance is going to, is going to bring something, but it might be five years from now, you know, it might be tomorrow. Um, and if I'm always treating those interactions as if we're writing a deal to close next week, it's, it's going to come around. For sure. So, um, I guess the, the other item on that besides, you know, being a good person and being, uh, you know, being disciplined, um, is being patient, you know, not yes. losing sight of, of the big, of the scheme of things. And that can yep. be really hard, you know, especially in an industry where it's all referral based. I'm not from here. I didn't walk into this business with the ability to say, you know, our, our dads played golf together. Right. Uh, right. You therefore do business with me. Um, not at all. Um, I haven't had any of that and it's taken time. So yeah, it's just keeping your chin up and, and busting your ass. <laughs> <laughs> keep, keep moving. Right. Yeah. All right. So, so last question for you, if you could pick one, what is the one piece of advice you wish you had known when you got started? Wow. That's a, that's a really good question. Um, I would say, uh, have a really detailed contacts database, hmm. save every, I mean, you know, a lot of the stuff that I've shared as far as, you know, philosophically how to carry yourself, yep. um, you know, that's really important. I guess, you know, not losing sight of the big picture. Um, that's, that's probably the biggest one, but from a practical standpoint, save all the contact information. Mm -hmm. you, know, you never know. Like I've had a lot of instances where people send us off market opportunities because of the way that we work with folks who are investing and folks who want to lend money. We saw sure. a lot of the sort of, uh, transactional equation just because of the way that our business is. But I've had a lot of instances where I talked to somebody one time for two minutes about a deal and five years later, the right deal comes up and we put it together. Right. Yep. Um, so just being really diligent and, and taking, you know, 
on that, you know, saving contact information, taking good notes, pay attention, you know, mm -hmm. always be, always be learning, you know, just say, you know, try and be a sponge, absorb as much as you can. Um, and then the other lesson that I would say is, you know, be humble, you know, oh, huge. You, might be, feeling, you might be feeling really good. You might have a really good month, but it's the, you know, the times when, when there's not stuff closing where, you know, you feel that. And again, if you're humble and you work hard and you might have moments where, you know, the, the tap is not running, you know, the, the well is dry. Um, but you know, don't panic. You know, if you, if you've done it the right way, the stuff comes back around your way. Absolutely. So, so David, to wrap up, if, uh, if people want to get in touch with you to learn more about you, learn more about select realty capital, what you do, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Uh, email David at select realty capital.com. And we could probably post all that when absolutely. Yeah. Um, and my office phone number is listed on our website. You can go to our website, select realty capital.com. Reach out to me on LinkedIn, Facebook, David Lichten is my name. Same thing on Facebook and LinkedIn, all that. Um, my phone number is listed on our website. You can also try me on my cell phone, which is 917-613-2130. I encourage people to reach out to me. You know, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a person who's going to accumulate a bunch of voicemails at the office and maybe call you back a week later. My office is, my cell phone is my office. So I'm always, you know, on and I'm, I'm again, try to be accessible. Um, and that's how you can reach me. SelectRealtyCapital.com, David at SelectRealtyCapital.com. Um, find me on my, uh, on my cell phone, Facebook, LinkedIn, all that stuff. Awesome. This was great, David. I a lot of fun talking to you, a lot of fun hearing about your story, a lot of fun really diving deep into private lending. So we'd love to have you back in the future. We should talk more about deal structure and, be awesome. and various projects and looking forward to that. Thank but you, for Gary. now, really appreciate the time. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. This was great. I really enjoyed it.